Well, good evening to you all. Trust that you are well. Able to find a parking space? You able to find a parking space okay? Is that on? <laughs> All right, okay. What I don't understand is this. I'm short-sighted, so I need to wear glasses as soon as I get up in the morning. Now, what I don't understand is when people who suffer from slight hearing loss, or more so, can, can go the whole day without turning their batteries on or, or, or anything else. I, I know. I was being gracious to you. I was practicing what it was to be gentle rather than... Cons Maybe it does. Maybe it does. Well, come on. Let's, let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that you are a God who is compassionate and loving. You understand us more than we do. Uh, and Lord, even in spite of who we are, you still pull up with us. And I praise you for that. And Lord, as, as we meet together this evening, we are smaller in number. But we pray, Lord, that we would have a time of real blessing a real encouragement, uh, and Lord, we ask this in your precious and your worthy name. Amen. Well, let's uh, start our worship or continue our worship this evening as we sing together our first song, Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Uh, I went to see Pete and Brenda this afternoon, uh, and it was quite a, a stark difference between the two. So I, I saw Brenda first, uh, and she was very, very low. Uh, she's, I think when she fell at home um, Thursday before last, it may well have been that she cracked a bone in her back. Uh, so she's, she has... It, if she has to walk around at all, she's got to wear some kind of brace. Um, and it depends, really, if, if, the, if the medics are happy to, um, to put this brace on to help her go to the bathroom or just walk around. Um, and, and she was very low. She didn't really want to eat today. No, no, no. So this is, this is part of uh, Brenda's, um, I think, frustration. Uh, she would like to be in rugby so that her daughters could could see her uh, and anyone from the church, but she's over in the Walsgrave um, University Hospital, Coventry. Charles, is that okay? Good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Anyway, let's, let's move on. So um, if you are able to go over and, and see her, I know she would really encourage just 10 minutes or so um, just to catch up. And so we chatted, we, we prayed together. Uh, and then I went to see Pete. Uh, and, and, and Pete was very different. Pete at the moment is enjoying ice cream with every meal. Uh, <laughs> because it seems that you can, if you want, have ice cream with your breakfast. So... Um, Essentially, Pete is having to uh, be able to balance. He's okay all the time he's lying down. He's okay all the time he's seated on on a chair. But when he needs to get up and hold on to his frame, uh, that is when uh, he struggles. Um, So do pray for Pete uh, and do pray for Brenda. That's right, that's right. Um, so go and, go and see them. I know that someone is going to be in there tomorrow. Uh, and and Pete's, uh, Pete's words were, oh, they've got to come and see me. All right, so um, please do that. Go and, go and see them both. Um, it was a real blessing for me, certainly, to go and see them. Um, but I was, I was told this morning by Charles of, of the death of one of the sort of leading statesmen in in the world in terms of uh, church ministry. Tim Keller, uh, age 72, died on uh, Friday last week. He died of pancreatic cancer. Um, And he uh, is a guy who moved to uh, New York, I think in 1989, uh, and set up a a church uh, which was aimed at the young professionals in New York. Uh, And he was there unequivocally preaching the gospel, in an age when uh, if you wanted to be big in the States, you you had your own TV show uh, and anything else. But his view was you just preach the gospel. So if you read any of his books, uh, if you listen to his his podcasts, uh, you would see a man who stood firmly for truth. So in a a city which was uh, highly liberal, he was preaching that actually uh, sex before marriage was not God's way homosexuality was not God's way and he, and he would be interviewed by uh, the major New York and Washington newspapers um, about his views. Um, he stood down in, in 2017 with the church only being 5,000 strong but having planted 12 churches in the city over his time there. Um, he will be missed. He was an elder statesman. He spent a lot of time with these churches as they were then training up men to go onto the mission field or to go into ministry within North America. Um, So we can give thanks for him. Uh, It's it's, it's wrong to, to in one sense, make saints out of these men, but at the same time, it's right that we honor them and remember them and pray that the next Tim Kellers would be there to take on the baton. And, um, and carry out God's work there. So uh, let's, let's come to prayer. In fact, actually, Charles, would you show the, uh, the clip that uh, I sent through? Uh, I don't know if you remember last year when uh, the, uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine. I was telling you about uh, a friend I've got who runs a home to the west of uh, Kiev. Uh, and um, a year on... Uh, the organization produced a, a, I think about three or five minute uh, film to say this is what we're doing at present. So Charles, if you're happy to, to play that. 370 days of war. 275 pounds of humanitarian aid. 332 children with disabilities received. 5,511 comprehensive medical and social rehabilitation services. 2,769,314 Ukrainian hryvnias of help for defenders of Ukraine. 2,571 consultations. 405 women with unwanted pregnancies found a way out of crisis situations. 407 babies born. We survived. From the first day of the invasion, we did not stop walking. We were there every day, ready to help. We looked in the face of fear. We did not know what would happen tomorrow. But despite this, the values of our organization manifested even more powerfully in action this year. 
our values. Compassion, help for the most marginalized, value for human life, integrity and excellence in everything we do. Guided by each of these principles, we stayed in touch 24-7. In the most difficult year for our country, we worked even faster and harder. Every day distributing foods, medicines, hygiene products, not only to the residents of our city, but way beyond its borders. We were in the hottest spots to support and provide our defenders with everything necessary. We work for the sake of life, we work for the sake of victory, and not only victory for our country, but also victory for our children in rehabilitation, for victories of women and families in crisis situations. Thank you to everyone who is with us, who loves children, who trusts us. Thank you to all people and organizations who care, who donate. We believe that this year will bring us not just victory, but also restoration of our country. And we will continue to work for you. We love you. Yours, Mission to Ukraine. Great. Do you remember this morning, um, I, I quoted uh, the writer of a book that I'm reading, Tony uh, Merida, Someone asked, why aren't there more signs and wonders in this church? And that he pointed to a lady who had just been, uh, who just lost her home with her children. And uh, he said, look, when we help people like that, that's when we see signs and wonders happening in the church where we are. Uh, so I was speaking to Ira von Venglovsky, uh, the lady who heads up the mission to Ukraine earlier this week. Uh, and she's very, very grateful, really, that there were partners around the world who were willing to pray for the organization. Uh, the lovely icing on the cake with Mission to Ukraine is that uh, the local council decided that the work that Mission to Ukraine were doing amongst the, the women, uh, the pregnant mothers, uh, and then uh, the veterans that had come back from the war injured, they said, you're doing such a good work, we want to give you a few acres of land uh, and some money to build. So at the moment, they're in the process of, of building there. Um, the, the mother organization is in the States, so Ira was over there uh, not long back uh, asking for, for funds, asking for money to continue this mission. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a work that loves the Lord Jesus uh, and loves people. Uh, and wants to see uh, God's kingdom growing even there. Well, I wonder whether a few of us could pray. We've, we've mentioned uh, Pete and uh, Brenda. We've mentioned the, the fruitfulness of the work of Tim Keller uh, in New York. We've got Mission to Ukraine. Uh, I wonder whether a few of us could pray, as well as bring, bring before the Lord anything else that we think it's right to do. Let's, let's share uh, our our praying and our encouragement together. Lord and Father, we pray that you would move us to prayer. We thank you for what we have seen already this evening. Amen. Amen. Beloved Heavenly Father, we thank you for Ash's ministry this morning and the challenge that it brought to us. Lord, we pray that we as individuals and as a church may exhibit the gifts and graces for yeah. Asia yeah. expressed in, in Paul's letters to the Galatians. Loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the mission to Ukraine, for the wonderful work that they're doing, for the responses that they're receiving from the mm. local.
Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. You know what? Look after my brother Philip. He's off um, driving for about two to three weeks now because he's got a lot of arthritis. It's really painful. And then, dear Lord, put your healing hands on him. Yeah. And may he be back to his normal strength. Father, we thank you for uh, the, the, the ministry and the pastoral love and care of Tim Keller. And Lord, we do pray now for his, his wife and his boys uh, and maybe family as well, uh, wives, grandchildren. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, help them in their grieving. But we know that in one sense they will be uh, delighted that he's, he's now in glory where there is no pain. Uh, but Lord, we do... Uh, praise and thank you for how you bless that work uh, and Lord we we pray that there would be uh, other men raised up like him both in this country uh, and in North America that your name would be glorified uh, as men with vision and initiative and pastoral care and men who will invest uh, of their, uh, their spiritual wealth uh, so that your church would grow. Father, we thank you for prayer. And we thank you, Lord, for a time even this evening when we can pray together. Uh, Lord, that it would encourage us. It would remind us that we are to come to you and place all our needs before you because you are that heavenly Father who wants to hear what is on our mind and on our heart. So, Lord, we ask as well that you would presence yourself with here or with us this evening, Lord, in mighty Pentecostal power, that you would, uh, you would transform our minds and hearts to be like that of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and Lord, that you would uh, do that and that we would love it. This we pray, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to uh, Genesis, Genesis 
chapter 27, and we'll be reading from verse 41 uh, through the, the whole chapter of chapter 28 as well. So Genesis 27, verse 41. And this is God's word that reads, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft? of you both in one day. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise. Go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty, or El Shaddai, bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojourning that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah's, Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed pa uh, Jacob and had sent him away to Padan Aram to take a wife from there, and that he blessed him, uh, uh, sorry, and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So, when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac his father, Esau went to Ishmael, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the, top of the, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring." Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 
So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, means the house of God. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Let's sing, I will glory in my Redeemer. We have a wonderful God, a wonderful Savior that we can sing of. So let's sing, I will glory in my Redeemer. Come back with me to uh, Genesis chapter 27. And in conversations with different people uh, on the Sunday evenings, I'm pleased that you've seen people, people have been surprised when they've looked at Isaac and Jacob. When we think about the patriarchs and we think about the, the, the famous men and women of the Old Testament, particularly those who were given these great promises by God, we can, we can hold them up there on that high pedestal, can't we? And then forget about the kind of life they lived. It, it amazes me um, that uh, uh, Moses wrote down that Abraham obeyed my voice, speaking of God, speaking of Abraham, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes 
and my laws. And you think, really? He didn't. But then we look at God and we say, what a compassionate and kind God we have. We, we, we look at the sins of Abraham. We look at the lack of faith. We look how he tried to do DIY conception and why he, or how he did DIY pleasing God his way. And yet he's there, the father, the man of faith. And then you look at Isaac and you think, well, Isaac surely is going to learn from his dad here. He's not going to make the same. Yeah, he does make the same mistakes. And then we come to these two sons of Isaac, and you think, what is going to happen there? And so as we look at his family, we see Isaac trying to sidestep God, trying to say, well, I know God has said this, but if I just step to the side and hopefully fool him, then I can still get what I want. He knew that he would, Esau would serve Jacob. You go back to chapter 25, uh, and I think it's verse uh, 23. Yes, it is. So um, in, in Rebecca's womb, the twins are struggling. They're jostling for position. And then we are, uh, God tells Rebecca, look, the older's going to serve the younger. Now, she must have told Isaac this. But then you've got the birthright being nicked. Then you've got Isaac trying to bless, uh, bless Esau, but he's, there's an old switcheroo that's taking place so that actually Jacob is in front. And again, Isaac's plans have been thwarted. God is still winning. And then we come to uh, various different things here. It's, it's, a, it's a tragic family. But we've got a good God. And, and so we see that at work here. So what I want us to do is, is briefly, as I did last week, try and pick out some of the key aspects of the story and then say, now what can we learn from this? Well, verse 41 to chapter 20 or 28, verse 9, we've got fearful parents. Do you know, some, some people wake up in the small hours of the morning with a sense of pending doom. Oh, what's going to happen? And it, it might be that kind of pending doom that we, we can't sleep. It may be that we wake up and then we can't get back to sleep. We, we're fearful. We, we're fretting. We, we're thinking, now what's, what's going to happen? Will it happen? And I wonder whether Rebecca was like this. Verse 41 of chapter 27, Esau says, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Isaac isn't dead yet. The days of mourning are coming. And then once, once my father is dead, then I'm going to kill Jacob. That's the plotting. Make no mistake. If this man... And we see it in chapter 26, verse 34 and 35. If this man was willing to defy his father and go and marry not just one, but two Hittite, Canaanite women, then this man was ready, ready and willing to kill his brother. And so Rebecca shows some motherly pressure to Jacob. She calls Jacob to herself. Uh, in verse 42, 43. So she calls Jacob to herself, 42. She informs Jacob of Esau's plot, verse 42. Verse 44 to 45, she says, Now, go to my brother Laban. Travel the, the, the 500 miles or so until Esau's anger has subsided. Now, she's a bit naive, really, isn't she? Remember last week, she said, Look, don't worry about the curse that your father may lay on you when he finds out. I'll bear the curse, thinking, no, you can't. And then this week, she says that actually Esau's anger is going to subside. Well, again, I think she's being a bit naive. And you see the mother's concern, don't you? At the end of verse 45, why should I lose two of you on the same day? So there, there we see... Uh, 
uh, Rebecca's motherly pressure. And to Isaac then, she says, verse 45, do you know what? My, my life is so awful at the moment. I've got those two foreign Hittite women living in the same area as me. My life is good for nothing. And so we have this sort of this female wife kind of pressure that's just sort of planting a seed in Isaac's mind so that he's the one that in chapter 28 verse 1 he says oh I know what I'm going to do I'm going to speak to Jacob because I've got a good idea and tell him to go to Laban's so he then says to Jacob look go but I hope you didn't miss the word blessed in verse 1 of chapter 28. Then Isaac called Jacob, and what did he do? He blessed him once again. So this, uh, this, this son, the younger twin, has had a double blessing as well as the birthright, and so everything is going Jacob's way. And so he says, look, go and find yourself a wife from, uh, from your mother's brother's home. But notice then what we see. Uh, we, we see a, a real blessing being given to Jacob. Verse 3, El Shaddai, God Almighty bless you. Make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. We've got something amazing taking place here. The blessing that was given to Abraham and the promise is given to Isaac, is given to Jacob, and in this chapter, we're going to see God doing the same thing. You can tell that God is in this, in this chapter. You may think, well, what, what a mess this family is in. But God is working into it in an amazing way. So that's our first part here. We've got fearful parents. Now, when, when we look at how parents or how adults act, we sometimes uh, do things on our own initiative. Are we doing the right thing? Were we doing what's best for our children or our families or for ourselves? And we trust that actually we're walking in step with God. And we have fearful parents here who trust that they're walking in step with God. There's certainly a righteous element to them because uh, both Rebecca and Isaac don't want Jacob to marry a Canaanite woman. So they're sending him away for that. So that's our, our first point here, that we've got fearful parents. But secondly, we look at Jacob's dream, uh, verse 12 through to verse 15. What I like, when I go to chapter 24, I see a servant in verse 10 who takes 10 of his master's camels... He ladens up the camels with all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he also has servants uh, that go with him. And he's got this whole caravan, this entourage that will follow him every step of the way. Every need of this servant is being catered for. He doesn't have to uh, worry about where is he going to sleep because his servants will pull up tents. He doesn't have to worry about who's going to feed the camels or water them because his servants will do that. And then we go to chapter 28, verse 5 and verse 6. And what we see is that Jacob essentially goes on his own. Sorry, verse, uh, verse 10 onwards. Jacob left Beersheba, went towards Haran, and he settles there in a place in between Luz and and AI. Now, if you know your patriarch history, someone came down from the north and settled for a short while 
in the area of Ai, and there set up an altar to God. It was Jacob's granddad. So Abraham, so um, Jacob now is traveling north, he's gone north for about two days, and he settles in a place in between Luz and Ai. He pulls up a rock, as we see there in verse 11, and he uses that as his pillow. And we have three wonderful beholds. Did you notice them? In the middle of the night while he's sleeping, we have a wonderful dream. And it's a dream, verse 12, of a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to the heavens. So we've got a, a ladder going to the full height of the ground to the heavens. And it's a glorious uh, sight. It's an angel-laden ladder. And at the top, wow, there's God. There's God. God in all his glory. God in all his majesty. So we see there, verse 13, it's the Lord, capital letters. We have uh, Yahweh. We have the creator of the heavens and the earth. We have the one that his angels are going up and down at his commission, at his summon. They're at his beck and call. And he's sending these angels down and they're ministering to Jacob. Where have we seen that before or where will we see that later? We see angels ministering to loved ones. Where do we see that most beautifully? Garden of Gethsemane. We see it in that remote place in a temptation where Jesus has, has withstood the power of Satan and then we see that angels came and ministered to Jesus. And we've got these angels just going up and down and there's just beautiful synchronicity as they're just moving around and God is at the top. So verse 12, Behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And verse 12, Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending. Just as we see as described in Hebrews 1.14, they're ministering servants who are descending. And then verse 13 and 14, And behold, the Lord stood above it. Moses has a point, doesn't he? Look, there's God in all his glory, in all his majesty, in all his compassion that he's ministering to this lonely pilgrim. This, this man who's, who's on the run because maybe he's fearing for his life. This man uh, who is sleeping on his own because there are no travelers around uh, where he could go and uh, ask if he can stay in their tent, which was a hospitable thing. This, this man who has been given these great promises, but there doesn't seem to be any fruition to them. And so God is just, for the moment, letting these angels and this sight minister to Jacob in his dream. And what we see in verse 13 uh, through to 15 is that God in his compassion is going to continue working and ministering to Jacob. We see uh, a promise confirmed, firstly. But even before we look at the detail in verse 13, he's speaking to Abraham, sorry, to Jacob, I am the Lord. This is the great I am. This is, this is the one uh, that, uh, that defies time. He was the creator of time. Before Abraham was, and he's only a grandfather, Jacob, before he was, I was. This is the God regaled in all his glory, in all his heaviness, in all his wondrousness. And so he speaks, I am the Lord. And he reassures him who he, is, who he is the Lord of, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Then he promises firstly something about land. 
The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised to, for you. I'll not leave you. This, this man who is going off to find a wife, in the meantime, has to make this long journey very much on his own. And God says, you'll have this land and I won't leave you. And do you know what? The comfort, the comfort for those who are saved here is this. And I was chatting with, with someone this afternoon about this. And I said, we have a God who does not leave us. We may not necessarily know his plans at this stage. We may not necessarily know why we are going through what we do. But we have a God that never leaves his people. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And God says this to this pilgrim. So he makes a promise of land. He makes a promise of descendants. Verse 14, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. Where have we seen this promise before? To Abraham, uh, chapter uh, 23 verse uh, 17 or is it 22 verse 17 I think it's 22 verse 17 yeah I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sand that is on the seashore and then we see it also in 26 verse 4 to Isaac God says what I've said to them I say to you and as we think about the Christian life down through the ages, down through the centuries. We have the early patristic fathers. We have Augustine. Then we keep on going. And then we go to, let's say, the Puritans. And then let's go to the, the people of the Great Awakening, the Whitfield, the Wesleys. And then we go to Moody. And then we go to Lloyd-Jones. And then we go to Tim Keller. And do you know, God's promises are the same all the way through. I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. And we can rely on that. So do you know what? Whether I am sky high at the moment or whether I feel pretty ordinary as a Christian. One, we should be used to being ordinary as Christians. But two, we should be thankful that God says, I will be with you. We don't need to be patriarchs or matriarchs. We need to be those that are following God. Because he's the one that is with us. So we've got the promise of land, we've got the promise of many descendants, and we've got the promise of nations being blessed through his descendants. Verse 14, in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The same thing was said in chapter 12, verse 3, to Abraham. The same thing was said to uh, Isaac in chapter 27, no, to Jacob in 27, verse 29, with a blessing there. God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. So how does that make us react? How should we react when we know that this is what God is like? He's willing to stand on top of this ladder and radiate his glory as he sent his, uh, his angels to minister to this sleeper. And then he's able to make this promise that Jacob needed and that actually all of us needed. So he didn't just make the promise, but he also uh, promised protection as well. Do you see it there? Verse 15, behold, I'm with you. God's presence. I'm with you. Uh, verse 15, God's protection. I'll keep you wherever you go. And again, verse 15, God's, God's boomerang promise. I'll bring you back to this land. Bring you back. Ken Hughes says, Jacob wasn't expecting grace, but grace was unleashed upon his soul. 
and with not even a word of reproach, the vision and the voice of God only bore assurance. Do you know, I'm so glad that God is to use a, 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 the, a theological word, God is immutable. He doesn't change. That, uh, for me, that is the, 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 the jewel of his character. I have a God who does not change. We have a God who does not change. And whilst these promises were specific to the patriarchs and to Jacob, nonetheless, these promises go through Scripture. They, they go through Scripture so that actually when we, when we get the full image of Christ and when we see him for what he is and when we understand uh, about his death, we, we then cry out like those, those men and women in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, what must we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. That was 2,000 years back. Do we still believe it now? Yes. And is it still as working or efficacious now as it was 2,000 years back? It sure is. What's Jacob's response? Time is whizzing on. I'm loving this too much. Um, Jacob's response, verse 16 through to 22. Verse 16 to 17. Oh, amazement and fear. Then Jacob awoke, awoke, sorry, awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. You see, Jacob, I don't think, realized this, that the whole of this place is inhabited by God. Jacob saw him in heaven, but actually God is the boss of all this place. And he says, and I didn't know it. Um, question for you. Is Jacob a believer at this stage? Okay, so we've got a yes and a no. I like that. We, we don't know, do we? Um, but he is, he is surprised uh, at what he sees. And I think he's surprised uh, at, at what God says to him. And he's in great shock because that's, that's how you should be when God makes himself known so openly like this. Uh, it, was, it was Moses uh, that, uh, that really showed what it was like coming face to face before God. It was Isaiah in Isaiah 6 who showed what it was like to come face to face before God. Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he's fearful. But then look how he describes uh, what, what goes on here. Surely the Lord is in this place. I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. There is none other than, this is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. This is where you can go up and down into heaven and see God in all his glory. The house is God's creation. The gate gives access to God and it's everywhere. So not only is there amazement and fear, but then there's worship, verse 18 and 19. So that the, the pillow becomes an altar. Maybe he lifts it up or that the stone becomes an altar. Maybe he lifts it up. Maybe he leaves it as it is uh, and he pours oil on it. The oil is, uh, becomes a sacrifice. Now, if we think never seen that before, a few years later on, Moses does the same in Leviticus chapter 8 verse 10 and 11. But he blesses this altar and he makes it a place where God is worshipped and he calls it a house of God. But then he makes a vow. And it's an odd vow, isn't it? Verse 20. Is it a good vow? Have a quick look through it. Is it a good vow? Don't rush. Don't rush. 
Oh, if it begins with if, and towards the end of it, it then goes into then, we wonder, what does Jacob really know about the one who's shown in this vision, the one he's speaking to? So here we go. If God will be with me, if, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, he's not asking too much, is he? So that I will come again to my father's house in peace, even though God has said, I'll give you this land and I'll bring you back, so that I'll come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So if he ticks off these boxes, then he'll be my God. He worshipped, yes, but what did he understand? So one, one commentator, Walton, says Jacob is still more scoundrel than saint at this stage. Uh, and another guy um, that uh, Philip Everson quotes, a bit more uh, lenient, Robert Cavendish says uh, that this is the response of faith to divine promise. I'm not sure. But what we see is that God goes with this man and accepts him. And if we're honest, how rock solid and grand is our faith always? It's not always, is it? We, we know the character of God. We, we understand his promises. But I think the shaky ground is not because of God's. The shaky ground is more because of us. And, and we can look at Jacob and say, all right, I hope I'm not a schemer and a deceiver like you, but I can understand where you're coming from at times. What can we draw out from this chapter? Well, very, very briefly, very briefly if I can. We see that the one who is at the bottom of the ladder is also our saviour. Do you remember what Jesus said to Nathaniel? John chapter uh, 1 verse 50. To Nathaniel, Jesus said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said, Truly, truly, never miss the trulies. I say to you, you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on whom? On the Son of Man. So we have the Son of Man, 81 out of 82 references in the Gospels, Jesus uses of himself. And he says that picture that Jacob saw is the one that you'll see of me. So the Son of Man is the one who would be ministered to, Hebrews 1, 14, by the angels who come and minister to the saints on earth and, and Jesus would be the new Israel. Remember Jacob, the name changes to Israel. And what we, what we see in Jesus is the new Israelite. So we have the new Israelite at the bottom of this ladder being blessed by his father. But what we also see is this, looking at this ladder. The one who is at the top of the ladder is also our savior, who will also be Jesus. So he was on earth with us for 33 years and then he ascends into the highest of places. Daniel 7 talk, the Son of Man is given all authority and power and dominion and even now our Savior, our older brother is standing in the very throne room of grace interceding for us. Speaking, speaking to his father on behalf of each and every one of us. And if we even pull our name in this publicly, I won't because of live streaming, but if we could pull our name in this, he's working for you. He's speaking to his father for you. He's saying to his father, remember that profession of faith, father. They're struggling, but remember them. Not only is he interceding for us, but he's mediating for us there in heaven as well. 1 John 2 verse 1 talk, where he's working on our behalf and speaking to our Father. 
is the son of man who is ministered to at the bottom of the ladder. He's the risen, ascended, glorious son of man at the top of the ladder. We also see that the old Bethel, the house of God, named there by Jacob, is wonderfully eclipsed by a living organism, a pulsating temple in which God's Spirit lives, even us. So we don't need to worry about an old rock near Luz or Rei. We don't need to worry about a pile of bricks like Railroad Terrace. We don't need to worry about a great big speaking conference place because the real church, the real Bethel, the real house of God is his people. And I wonder, my, my desire in the mornings is, is that we come away thinking, we are the church. We meet in a chapel. We meet in a building. But God's great idea and God's great passion and love is creating us to be that new Bethel ready to go to the new heavens and the new earth where we will then become the bride of Christ. And lastly, I just want to just reiterate something. We note that in all of this, there is nowhere on earth or in the universe where El Shaddai is not God. The Bible tells us there is a heaven. There is nowhere where El Shaddai is not God. And that surprised Jacob, but it should not surprise us. Well, it's a wonderful passage, isn't it? Plenty there to bring out uh, and thank God for. Now, it may well be that tonight all we, all we go away is thanking God that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and who will keep his promise to those who profess faith in him. And so we can give thanks that God is the one who goes with us through thick, through thin, through blessing, through perceived lack of blessing. We have a God who is with us, who will bring him back to this place, will bring us to heaven. We have a saviour, son of man, who is there on earth for us, who is in the heaven now for us, pleading and working for us. What a God we have. Well, I wonder whether uh, we can spend brief time in reflection uh, on this and, and prayer uh, and we'll come straight to the Lord's table. It's, it's a, a meal here for believers, isn't it? And it's a meal we can take great delight in. And it's a meal where actually we know the end from the beginning, unlike Jacob, who was surprised. We need not be surprised because we know of the provision there at Calvary. We know of the provision uh, from there after. So let's just spend a bit of time in quiet reflection and then we will uh, continue with our worship.